Am I good to go? Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is John Hart Asher. I'm a senior environmental designer with the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, uh, Department of Ecological Research Design at University of Texas at Austin, part of the School of Architecture. And that's about the end of that because it's way too long winded. Uh, <laughs> it's really horrible writing uh, emails and messages out with all that. Um, so, very briefly, I have a background in landscape architecture. I wanted to save the world with plants. Luckily, I got to work with the Wildflower Center uh, in that. L landscape architects really aren't trained in plants anymore. Um, there's a lot of people that want to go out there and, and learn how to design cities and do all this stuff, but they've pushed plant knowledge and everything off to, you're going to go work with this star architect or whatever, and then they'll teach you about plants there. What's the, you know, what, what does it really matter for us to train you about plants? here in Texas or something because you're going to live in California or Boston or something like that, which is a really big disservice. And it's kind of like getting a master's in fine arts and painting and you're just taking theory, right? Like, yeah, you understand what painting is, but until you actually work with the media, then you're not really an artist. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, I was really excited to hear Dr. Jacobs talk. Um, I'm a big proponent of doing restoration within urban areas. I believe we're going to save prairies and grasslands by making these things valuable to people. Uh, there's a direct human health and well-being connection. There's many uh, uh, ecological benefit that we get out directly from there. Um, and this is uh, specifically talking about floods that happened in Memorial Day in uh, Wimberley, Texas, or Wimberley Blanco <laughs> area um, and sort of how we approached uh, this problem. Really briefly, my group uh, started in 2000, Dr. Steve Windhager. Uh, went to the center and said, look, you need to have people out there. They're essentially the Wildflower Center outside the center's walls where you are, we're carrying on that mission, restoring prairies, doing all sorts of stuff. And initially, um, a majority of our work was ranch land, was people out there that, you know, wanted to restore, do something where it's altruistic or whether it was better forage production or something like that. Like that. Now over 90 eight percent of our projects are urban we do all urban restoration and that's the trend and that's really something that's exciting for us um, our what we sort of uh, operate through is we we research uh, we teach and apply and it's a wonderful feedback loop we are part of the school of architecture so we're teaching some of the landscape architects and architects as best we can to think about how you approach uh, environmental design um, students tell us what they're really interested in, which helps us come up with research topics. And then we also see that in the marketplace. And then we also do active consulting um, and apply that. So we have 20 years of prescribed fire program. The Wildflower Center is a garden, but over 250 plus acres, a majority of that goes into research that's been going on. So we're looking at burning at different times of the year, mowing all that stuff. Does that, is that like grazing? Um, and we're just just now starting to get some of that data to come out. Um, some other research we did was green roofs and, uh, and for semi-arid subtropical climates. We had a lot of people coming in saying, uh, manufacturers saying our green roofs are failing here in this neck of the woods. Why is that? Well, the shorter answer is they took technology from temperate environments, so Germany, the UK and whatnot, uh, which, you know, it, you can grow anything there apparently. Uh, but here we're a little bit tougher and rougher. So. We solved that problem with uh, native plants, and we've now gone on, I call this the modern hobbit. This guy's a, a lawyer and a science fiction writer. <laughs> Only in Austin, right? Um, so also we teach again, School of Architecture. We did a, pro, uh, a class up the Badlands National Park System talking about how they might want to think about some restoration up there. And again, urban prairies are, uh, supposed to be a movie, but urban prairies are a big, component of what we do. This is the uh, George Bush Presidential Center in Dallas where we did about 16 acres of tall grass prairie right smack in the middle of the city um, and it's really wonderful and it's a great teaching tool. I go there there's a certain dem demographic that frequents that place and when I'm up there for inspections a lot of the time I get a lot of why in the hell don't y'all mow this place? <laughs> All that sort of question but that's really a wonderful opportunity to engage people that first think of the landscape as an aesthetic versus something much more diverse. 
Um, so we'll get into more Memorial Day 2015. Here is uh, Wimberley, Texas area, the Blanco River, if you've never been there. Iconic, beautiful uh, water, these huge 700, 1200 old uh, uh, bald cypress trees. People love this place. A lot of people from Houston go on vacation up there. Um, and just absolutely stunning, idyllic little town. Well, Memorial Day, um, they got a rain bomb. And in about 10 to 11 hours, uh, over 35 trillion uh, uh, gallons of water fell in a small little area and that's enough rainfall to cover the entire state of Texas in eight inches of water and so that happened up in Blanco and Wimberley's downstream a little bit and you can see just with in a short span of time from 1030 to 1 a.m. they went from above what was there uh, a major flood stage so you know close to 28 29 feet and they just blew past that uh, where they were, they were north of uh, 40 feet within just a couple hours. There was loss of life. There was a lot of loss of property. People, you know, love to live on this little uh, river area. And again, it's the same things as, you know, we're talking about the ecosystems we live in. They're disturbance-driven ecologies, right? So there's fire, right? These riparian areas, there's also flood, right? And so these people had been the old, you know, flood map said they were sort of outside of that 100-year flood plain. They're okay, uh, but we're coming up with new flood plains now, right? All the the old is no longer applicable. Saw major extensive damage to infrastructure, just stuff coming down. Uh, uh, this might be the Fisher Store Road, um, but multiple bridges uh, went down. And you can see some of these trees, again, they're, they're huge. They went all along the, the, the river banks. I mean, you look at that root mass. It's just absolutely gigantic. I mean, but also look at the energy flow that was going on. All that stuff that's coming down, that debris, just totally uh, just ripped off that, that cambium of the tree. And just, you know, some of them made it. Some of them that stood didn't make it, essentially, because they were girdled. So, uh, Everybody thought, you know, these trees will be there forever, but the interesting thing was is if you could have stepped back and seen this root mass, you'd only see there's like two or three feet of soil before it hit the limestone. Um, and so people thought that these things would be there forever. I mean, they practically had been, but they were, they were gone. They were annihilated. So you saw some of this damage, uh, but more importantly, when you look down here are these tracks. Shortly thereafter, Big disaster, and then also what is that? That's an opportunity for contractors. Let us come in, let us beautify your landscape. Let us get all this trash out of there, this horrible organic material that's just, <laughs> just, just can't be there, you know? Let us clean the landscape. And in doing so, they're making an already damaged landscape even that much more vulnerable. And again, they're talking about aesthetics. So there was, there was people, there are landowners, uh, my mom lives in Wimberley, not on the river, but there are landowners who were seeing their neighbors doing all this sort of stuff, hiring these people and tearing up the land. They're like, what are we going to do? Um, and certainly in the state of Texas, everybody's about property rights. You know, you certainly can't tell the other person what they can or can't do with their land. But they wanted to talk about, you know, can we just stop for a minute and have a discussion about why and what we're uh, doing. So we, we reached out with the, the Nature Conservancy um, and also Parks and Wildlife um, and started to meet with areas. And I also started to go on Facebook, maybe one of the few times Facebook was actually an agent of good, um, and started <laughs> speaking with people and, and socializing and trying to see, you know, what do you want to hear, what do you want to talk about? Well, then also you had messages, messaging coming through multiple organizations. The state's message was, let the rivers heal. Don't have contractors come in here and remove that horrible, large, woody debris, even though that thing's going to anchor the soil, create habitat, serve as a nursery and protect it from, from all the, deer, the explosive deer population there from eating all the stuff that's going to try to regenerate. They were just sort of, let the river heal. Great. But a lot of people were like, Hell no, that's not acceptable. Hayes County, which is the, uh, the county that, that Wimberley's located in, was uh, we're going to plant trees. 
We've got to plant trees. We've got to put trees. The trees are down. We've got to plant trees. Trees, trees, trees. You love trees? I love trees. We all love trees. Who doesn't love trees? Let's plant trees. We'll give them to you for free. Great. Wonderful news. Um, we were on part of the, some of the, the, the county meetings, and so I was the sole person that sort of raised their hand in the room and said, Any, anybody think about the herbaceous understory? Of course not, because that is an unfortunate name in itself. Who wants to talk about an herbaceous <laughs> understory? But, you know, grasses, sedges, forbs, all that sort of stuff, right? That, that's really important, too. Did, did we not just notice all the, what is the stuff that just got ripped out of the ground? Were these huge, massive things called trees? And then we also went by Guadalupe State Park where they had eastern gamma grass, switchgrass, some of those big guys. They laid down, the waters receded. They pop back up. Outside of some of the debris you saw, you couldn't even tell that there was a flood event. And it, 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 the, the, the deep fibrous root systems anchored the soils, and then they also uh, protected from the surface when they were laying down. So uh, some of the other response as well was, well, let's stop. You know, this is, a, this is one of the fastest developing uh, counties in, in the nation. And so some of the response was, we need to talk to them about how surface uh, flow, uh, wh how we're going to deal with that. So you had some efforts where these individuals are taking all this flood debris and sort of making these uh, uh, sort of like check dams almost to sort of slow that velocity down off some of the areas. And that's great too. But again, there was, there was these landowners that really want to know like, what in the world am I, I want to do? I want to have river access. I want to have a nice... Uh, you know, something that looks nice, but also I, I hear what you're saying. So what, what, how do I need to fix my landscape? So we held some workshops about active restoration. So there's, if you want to let it heal, you can. If you want to do all these other things, there's yes and, right? We don't, we're not binary, we're not you're wrong, you're right. But here's this active approach where we can tell you how you can start to restore your landscape, but not put it all back in St. Augustine right, which a majority of it was going up there because they wanted river access, right, and it was, and then you have people worry about snakes and stuff like that, but, but you know, this is healthy. I mean, and to me, that's iconic, right, that's, that's, that's hill country, that's why everybody went there in the first place. This is just sort of what I call the aesthetic aesthetic, right, and all of this went away. When that water went over, that just got ripped up and was gone, and these people lost a majority of their their access. Uh, and mainly it's because, right, they don't have the roots. You know, it's, it's I mean, St. Augustine, I, I, you know, it's great. I love the lawns, are, they're great. But, you know, that in that condition, it just, when it was all that versus having some of that and some of this, or all this, I, you know, I don't want to be a purist, but <laughs> if you had both, right, it's that that saves all of this and makes us the soil safe and resilient. And again, getting back to the unsung or, un, uh, herbaceous understory, which actually is a great band name now that I think about it. <laughs> uh, it's because this is this plant community, right? We've got the woodies, we've got the herbaceous material, and they're acting together. And, and Steve Nelly, who is a wonderful, uh, he wrote, remar remarkable riparian, uh, super knowledgeable about uh, hill country <coughs> river systems. Really, the best way he put it was, you know, the trees are our bones, and that herbaceous content is the, the connective tissue, and together they form this resilient system. And the other thing as well that we don't see in a lot of landscape designs is we have different age classes of the woody material too, right? So what we did see in the flood was some of the younger stuff did make it. It laid over, it was flexible enough, the big guys kind of <laughs> But we need those different age classes so that we have succession, right? Something that a lot of people don't think about. So I'll go through this really quickly again. I, don't, I, have, I did way too many slides for this, but part of this effort, we put out 130, in three weeks, we put out a 137 page booklet called the Blanco River Design Guidelines that gave a restoration uh, strategy and all these talking points and we actually applied a design to an actual property and did a whole CD set, design set, to show them if you really wanted to do th some things. Um, and I'll walk through that briefly. So this is Jackaroo Ranch. Uh, I forgot the laser. Right here. Uh, this got uh, torn up pretty bad. All these houses were lost for the most part. 
So that the, the river went way out over here. Um, and we looked at how could we, if we were gonna choose a property, what would, what would be a good example? And we chose this one because one, it has an upland condition. Again, I love the messaging. Oh God, five minutes. Okay, love the messaging <laughs> of uh, that the uplands are connected to the riparian areas, right? And the wetlands, they're absolutely something we shouldn't look, them, look at them as disjunct sort of things. And a lot of the public thinks of them very compartmentalized, right? Like wetlands, uplands, this sort of thing. But they're very much connected. So you had an upland condition you could restore. You had a uh, residential area, so you could do some more sort of residential design. A canopy area, it's hard to see the trees. They've sort of dropped the leaves here. And then the riparian area. And so we did our typical, uh, and this is in that design booklet, we did our typical design layout that you would, taking the survey, getting all the contours and whatnot, starting to sketch and say, okay, this is what we could push it back towards. Again, we're aiming towards historic climax plant communities, uh, but we've also got to think about how this functions for these people. So we went from, again, what was just sort of flat mode, sloping down towards the river to something where, um, one, we can have whole capacity. So that upland, we're gonna create some micro topography so there's water retention. We also want to look at this as a strategy of if everybody started to do something and try to hold on to water, especially in this area with this fast developing, then cumulatively that really has a big effect, right? We're not just pushing the water off into the river. That's why we see a lot of flooding, same thing in Houston, whatnot, it's impermeable surface, but it's also the way that we want to look at water as a waste versus a resource as opposed to grabbing onto it we're just sho shoving it down into the rivers. So we have a, a bios uh, detention area here, LID feature, and then we have a little area that will allow the water to, to run through in a concentrated area, but we also have gabion uh, structures that allow that sheet flow to break up over time and dissipate some of that energy. And here you can see, are walls those are walls. So you'll see we have some 3D rendering. So here's an axon that we did. So here you can see the detention area so we bermed up some of this area so that we give a little bit, there's a public street right here, give them a little bit more privacy. Um, and so you can see, yes, these little gabion rock walls, which are great features for an habitat for lizards and snakes and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, they'd be a couple, uh, you can do them all sorts of sizes, but three feet, two feet, not very high. Um, and again, you'll see some of the images, but the big thing again is stop the mowing up here. We do some restoration work. We do some manipulation. Um, we're letting tall grasses come back to a majority of the area. So mid grass over here a little bit as you get closer. Tall grasses over here with some access for the river. You don't need to have access. You're not using the entirety of the river. And again, we're looking at the, the upland re residential riparian buffer, riparian canopy. And again, you can see that our plan for the water is really for it to be captured on site versus what it was doing, sort of shunting it off the side and pouring it down holding on to that land. So really quickly through section, uh, we're looking at the uplands. So here are some of the functions. Because again, we, we don't just design the way we look. We, uh, I get a, a couple of extra though, right? Because we started late. No? OK. Uh, so anyway, we, we, we were looking at, everything is tied to function. So we're, we're, we're looking at slowing and in, in, infiltrating, um, thinking about what plants we're going to do. So we also have to think about the colonizers. Um, the soil builders are the later successional species, right? So these colonizers we know are wonderful to help s fix uh, those soils once they've just been dis uh, disturbed, bring in those bacterial populations. Um, and we can seed those. We usually might have to plug some of these later successional species because we don't have that symbiotic relationship built up with the, the mycorrhizae and whatnot. The soil's not quite right there. Always liking to bake in a cake. We can put all the materials together, but the one element that's very important is time, right? And that's the same thing with prairie restoration. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an approach. It's not just a one and you're done intervention. It is a trajectory over time. And that's how you have to approach these things. So you have to think about these things over a time span as well. Um, here's a rendering of what that actually would look like if we, we did that. Uh, our talented landscape architect, the Wildflower Center, Adam Barb, uh, did some of these renderings. Here you can see the little low gaby in there. But that would be what was a flat mode, King Ranch Blue Stem, which is an invasive dominant area. Now is this essentially this little pocket prairie. And again, small scale, but cumulatively, if everybody's doing this, um, we're done. I'm telling my time's out. So I'm just going to go through this really, really quickly. 
So again, some areas, all emphasis on natives, obviously we're biased at the Wildflower Center. We love our natives. But something where we can use some of those plants and colors and textures in more formal applications. Here's a riparian canopy, so you're starting to see some of these walls come down, so they're acting functionally. They're visually, they give you connect connectivity throughout, so it looks great. Uh, but also, they're, they're slowing that water and let it infiltrate. And then again, uh, the other area, looking at soil stabilizers. But you can see how this sort of works, gives them plenty of access, but feels of the place. But also, it's all natural components. So when a flood comes through, and it will again, what the Army Corps of Engineers worried about, are you having non-natural uh, stuff breaking down, right? So this goes downstream, it's just rock and whatnot. Um, typically these design projects are uh, really siloed, so the designers are here and then you have the construction people come in to do this and then you have the maintenance and that's why landscapes are horrible and they don't work. And so we really talk about breaking down those silos and having the designers uh, work with the contractors uh, so they understand the intent and what the importance is. Not doesn't mean you're not going to have issues, but also maintenance concern throughout the life of it, because um, that's a really big impact uh, to the site. And again, these are just some really quickly. I promise. Uh, <laughs> we actually built parts, so that was going to cost a lot of money, but that was sort of we we're swinging at the fences just to show you what you could do if you really wanted to do it. Parks and Wildlife love this and they wanted to actually fund a smaller version of this to use as a pilot site. So we did, broke back out with our sketchbook again and looked at access to the area. So we created some um, detention elements to capture all that sheet flow, told them to stop mowing up here, and then we create a little access area. Um, and again, you can sort of see some of the construction. You can see how scoured everything was. That's still weedy growth about a year afterwards. Um, here they're putting in the detention elements um, and then we went out there with uh, volunteers and seeded and planted some of those areas Didn't have a huge budget but you can see in August 2015 pretty rough scoured here and then uh, in May here 2017 we've got sort of the formal framework done there you can see we started recording in six, six inch events is capturing a significant amount holding it on site um, she was worried because she does rent one of the cabins out to people uh, that, that was going to impact. They're going to say like, what happened to the traditional landscape? But they're all like, this is amazing. This is extremely important. Um, and so they get the no mows. They have access to where they need to go, but they have all that. And that's really as quickly as I can go. So. <laughs> <laughs>